Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Right Lock Farm. Uh, my name is Archie McIntyre, and I'm the executive director here at Right Lock Farm. And I'm really pleased to see such a great turnout on what's turning out to be our first cold night of the season. Uh, so let me, I do this. I, always ask, uh, how many people, uh, is this their first visit to Right Lock? Excellent. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's good to see a lot of new hands or a lot of hands for people who have been here many, many times. Uh, but I think I guess a balance is good. New hands mean that we're reaching new people, uh, but um, the people who have been here before means we haven't bored them to tears so far. So uh, that's a good sign. Um, so this is uh, our sixth and final speaker series uh, for the season. Um, we welcome David Waters from Community Servings, who will be speaking speaking with us in just a few short moments. Um, but this is our last uh, event of, of this type for the year. Um, the weather is turning on us, and at this time of year, a lot of our public programming um, and outreach kind of shuts down for the season. Um, and we put the farm to bed for the winter and to start the next spring. Uh, we're hoping to make a change to that by um, uh, our work to um, uh, plan for and fundraise for a four-season barn, which we are planning for the hill uh, where the, the yellow house is, and we're hopeful that we'll start that project this time next year so that we will be able to offer programming here year-round uh, and hopefully have more impact and do more things uh, around what we love to do here at the farm. So Right Lock Farm is a 20-acre community farm. Uh, our mission is to build community broadly through active learning, sustainable agriculture, land stewardship, and an appreciation of our historic structures. Uh, we grow certified organic crops, we do farm-based education, and we have events, both public and private. We are a nonprofit, so what we do is we um, hopefully earn revenues from those three major activities uh, to support our daily operations. And then we go out to our generous community for projects like a new uh, Four Seasons Barn, which will allow us to extend our programming. So it's all um, an effort of paid staff and many volunteers. Um, but it's in support of our community, and we thrive by engaging our community. So we're very happy to have you all here tonight. And I'm going to pass um, the mic over to Kim Neeland, our community engagement manager, to introduce David. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Archie, and uh, welcome to the farm. Um, it is such a pleasure. I've been here for five years and I've worked uh, many kind of all bits of the farm um, and one of the things that I've gotten to do is coordinate the speaker series and it's been great to see it grow and uh, yeah just how much excitement and inspiration it brings in conversation uh, really the speaker series was brought about to start encouraging and sharing knowledge and you know doing so uh, in a way that all can access and um, yeah so it's just been really lovely um, Archie kind of already stole all of my talking points. So, um, but thank you again for coming out on such a chilly night. Um, definitely stay cozy tonight. Um, you know, if you've got to do a little shuffle around and maybe we do a little jumping jack break, I don't know. We'll see. Hopefully we can generate a little bit of heat between all of the bodies. So we'll be nice and toasty in here. Um, we are on our final session. Um, and you know, um, kind of to keep that building, I, I want you, I'm going to ask you during uh, David's speech tonight, um, or his talk rather, um, just keep that idea of an all seasons barn here at Right Lock Farm because when we originally met uh, David and went to community servings and did this, uh, did a visit there, you know, our, our, we were just floored. We were blown away by all of the different things that they were doing and how they all linked, uh, together and, um, you know, just the important work of healing their community healing. I mean, it's a, it's a broad community too, all over Massachusetts. So, um, you know, we started 
it, it's really done a lot to help us uh, stretch our thinking and um, start figuring out and brainstorming what we can do, how much more like greater and positive lasting change we can make. Um, so, you know, just kind of think about what he's talking about and, you know, kind of let's mull on it. Let's, let's, uh, I, this is what the speaker series is for to kind of start jogging some, some inspiration, passion, getting ideas going. Um, but, uh, I will stop taking up your time and I will introduce, uh, David here. Um, cause I just love, I just love hearing about all of the things that he does and, and the organization does. So, um, David Waters has been involved with, uh, community serving since it began, uh, moving from volunteer to board member, board chair, director of development, and eventually CEO in 1999. Uh, he has helped community servings grow from a small neighborhood meals program to a critical regional organization providing nourishing meals to 2,000 people with acute life-threatening illnesses, their dependents, and caregivers all over Massachusetts. Uh, he is a former board chair of the Association of Nutrition Service Agencies, and is also a founding member of the National Food is Medicine Coalition. Um, and in recognition of his leadership and impact at community servings and within the greater Boston community, David was named uh, a Bar Foundation Fellow in 2017. So again, they're doing some amazing things uh, at community community servings, and I'll let David describe them because he's much better at it than I am, but um, yeah, uh, we're just, we're so pleased to have him on the stage tonight, so uh, I'd love you to help me welcome here, up here on the barn stage. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. My apologies, I have a tickle in my throat, so if you hear me clearing my throat, don't take it personally. Um, water there. Water. I, got, I got myself stocked up here with water. So hope I don't lose my voice. Wow, this is so cool, huh? What a great space. I've done a lot of talks, but not in such a beautiful barn and everybody bundled up trying to stay warm. Uh, but that's what harvesting is all about, right? That's what our forebears did. It's so cool. And seeing the wagons and everything. Uh, I, I love it. My dream is someday community servings will have uh, their own farm. So this is really exciting. Um, as was mentioned, I've been involved with community servings since it was first founded. Um, we were originally founded to feed people with AIDS. We were the Jewish response to the uh, the Jewish response to AIDS at the height of the epidemic. Uh, if you're old enough to remember those very scary days. Um, what you probably don't know is that the majority of people in the early years died of malnutrition. Uh, it was what was called AIDS wasting syndrome. Your body was exposed to the virus and it went crazy trying to kill it. Um, but outwardly you felt like you had the flu, so you stopped eating, as we often do. Um, and your body would essentially burn all of its lean muscle mass. So if you think of the early days of the AIDS epidemic, it was primarily young men uh, in the early years, and they would lose 30 to 40 pounds of lean body mass and essentially die of malnutrition and starvation. So there were not yet drugs invented. They were still in the pharmaceutical pipeline, so to speak, AZT and the drug cocktails. Food became the only medicine. So for a program like Community Servings, we were focused on cream and butter. Put as much cream and as much butter on everything, <laughs> literally trying to fatten up the people we loved to help them to stay a few more weeks, a few more months while we were all um, you know, f fervently hoping for a cure for AIDS. Um, and of course, most people in those early years didn't survive. Um, most of this conversation is a very uplifting conversation, but I sort of want to start with a baseline of what community servings clients face. Um, and so I think one of the things that unites all of us, even on a chilly night like tonight, is that sometime in our life we will care for someone we love who's very, very sick and perhaps dying. And it will be, without a doubt, the hardest thing that any of us do whether it's our parents or our spouse or, God forbid, our children, it will be the hardest thing we ever do. 
But now if you think of all the blessings that we have, if you live here in Winchester, you probably have a roof over your head. You probably have a bank account. You probably have a, a pantry full of food. Uh, you probably have a credit card. You probably have friends and family. Uh, and maybe Winchester even has a great network where they bring casseroles to neighbors who are sick. A lot of suburban communities have that. But if you start to strip those away and you say you have unstable housing, you don't have money, you don't have food in your cupboard. Uh, you don't, no one even knows you're, you are where you are. No one's knocking on your door. How unbelievably scary it could be uh, and how just overwhelming. Uh, you're trying to care for your kids, but you're going to your chemo treatments. You're going to your dialysis, dialysis appointments, but you're supposed to be seeing, I don't know, seeing your parole officer or, or just all the chaos that, we all have chaos in our lives, and we here in the room are probably fairly good at managing it. But when you have as much chaos as our patients have, it's just too much. So community servings, and it's really, community servings is about the community serving the community. So we all come together to say nobody should be alone when they're scared, sick, and isolated. And that's kind of the, the spiritual mantra of what we're doing, whether whatever you're uh, Beliefs might be. Um, we believe that food is that magic thing that is. Tr uh, we all have a connection to in our own cultures, but is going to bring us together. So, with that, community servings is a not-for-profit business. We started 28 years ago, as I said, to provide medically tailored meals and nutrition services to individuals and their families coping with critical and chronic illnesses. It was originally a program for people with AIDS and HIV, but it expanded about mm, almost 15 years ago to feed people with any illness. I've been involved since the very beginning, started out as a volunteer, uh, and we sort of had our head down feeding people with HIV and just assumed that somebody else was feeding women with breast cancer or people with kidney failure or advanced diabetes. And then as we got more mature, we realized nobody else was doing that. If you think of food interventions in this country, we've made a commitment to feeding children through free um, school programs, breakfast, lunch programs. And we've made a commitment to feeding uh, seniors through Meals on Wheels programs. But the idea of feeding the sick is not something that ever was really in our vernacular. The society has not made a commitment to it. So. I'm here to tell you why we should be making that kind of commitment. Um, because people can be just as scared and isolated uh, when they're very, very sick as they might be if they were elderly or a child who only gets one meal a day and is trying to learn and run around the recess, et cetera. So just a couple of basic facts about food insecurity. Everybody knows food insecurity means you don't necessarily know where your next meal is coming from. Or in the course of a week, you don't know whether your food is going to last. Um, but what a lot of people don't know is that food insecurity has a direct relationship. It's intuitive, really, but to um, poor health outcomes. So if you're food insecure, you don't know where your food's going to come from, you're 25% uh, greater at uh, hospital admission for hypoglycemia at the end of the month when your food stamps run out, when your SNAP runs out. You're two times... Uh, more likely to have bad diabetes control because you're uh, food insecure, which causes you to go to the ER more uh, and hospitals more. We have a patient who every month her diabetes would run out. I mean, her uh, when her food stamps ran out, her A1C levels for diabetes would go out of control. She'd pick up the phone and call 911 and an ambulance would take her to the ER every month and the ER would stabilize her. Um, one of those trips to the ER and the ambulance is probably enough money to feed her for a whole year. That's how expensive it is to go to the hospital. Uh, and your 50% uh, increase in kidney disease, especially in patients with diabetes or high blood pressure, all because of food insecurity. Um, uh, chronic diseases and conditions, including heart disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes, and obesity are among the most common, costly, and preventable. One in three patients in America enters the hospital malnourished. Their stay is going to be three times as long because they're malnourished. 
and their cost will be three times as high. So it begs the question, why aren't we addressing their malnutrition? We're all beating our heads against the wall when we look at our health insurance bills and the rates that go up. Um, my employees just saw a 16% increase just this year. So we're all going crazy how to deal with the, whether you like Obamacare, don't like Obamacare. Um, we're all struggling with this, but no one's saying something as basic as, well, maybe if we fed people. Uh, and, I, and I'm always careful to say, if you're in the healthcare world, we don't say feed everybody. We say feed people where there are poor health outcomes directly related to diet and where the hospital system is losing money. Maybe it's cheaper to feed them. And maybe it's even cheaper to feed them forever. Uh, because uh, if they can't control their diet on their own, that might make sense. It's certainly the humane thing to do. Um, and then you, if you know anything about healthcare reform in this country, hospitals are being penalized for readmissions. 80% um, uh, of hospitals in Massachusetts will be penalized for higher than expected Medicare readmissions. If we can control people's diets, we can keep them out of the hospital and we can keep them from being readmitted. <laughs> so community servings intervention involves three things. It involves beautiful food. If you think of uh, sick people, what's the first thing they lose? Their appetite. They're depressed. They're nauseous from chemo treatments. They're on a lot of medications. It's changing their flavor uh, experience, their taste buds, metallic taste. Um, if we bring them what I call my high school cafeteria food, kind of gray mystery meat, they're not gonna eat it, right? We've all seen that. Uh, sadly enough, that's often what you get in the hospital. Um, so in community, for community servings, our primary focus is how do we get you to eat when you have no appetite? So that starts with beautiful food like they grow here on the farm, uh, whole foods. Um, there's no preservatives in our food. We're doing scratch cooking the old fashioned way. We're roasting bones and vegetable scraps, making all of our soup stocks from scratch. We're not using um, soup bases. We're not using canned products. We're not using processed foods. It's all made from scratch the old fashioned way. Um, and then what we are able to do, and I'll tell you more about this, is we're able to tailor our meals to suit someone's particular needs. We can take up to three different uh, prescriptive diets in the same meal. I'll tell you about that. And then at the same time, we wrap that around with nutrition counseling and nutrition education for our patients. So. Uh, I've spent time in the hospital, and I saw my mother spend uh, time in the hospital. And the five minutes before I was discharged, um, the dietitian comes in and says, "Here's all the ways you're going to change your diet." And they're going to hand you. They're going to. They handed me some Xerox pages, um, and I was actually in for heart surgery. So all I could think of was what happens when they unplug that monitor that's keep I think is keeping me alive and my husband's sitting next to me and he's thinking yeah do I really want him back he's sort of damaged goods <laughs> and both of us are, are professionals in the food business and we had no idea what this dietitian just told us because she said here are all the ways you're going to change your diet well our diets are based on what our mothers made for us what our grandmothers made for us what our cultural background is what foods we know how to cook and if I didn't get it, how do you get it when you have all the other chaos in your life? So nutrition counseling and education is really important because ultimately we want people to leave our program and go back to doing what we all do, which is going to the store and making our own food. So we call this food as medicine, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute, but it's essentially using food in the context of health and healthcare. Uh, trying to motivate people to eat. So here are the 15 different medical diets. So we start with a basic healthy diet for people who may not need something customized. We also feed the whole family when we feed a sick individual because we know a sick parent's gonna give the first meal to their child. So oftentimes the spouse or the caregiver might be getting a wellness diet. Cardiac meals, diabetic meals, renal diets for kidney failure, um, low acid, uh, pescatarian, high calorie, uh, high protein for people who are wasting because of chemo. Uh, you can sort of see the others in there. But what's really incredible is that we can combine up to three of these medical diets in the same meal and still make it scratch cooking. So if you had um, advanced diabetes, 
you would have to obviously manage your glucose levels, your A1C. Uh, and I should say, I'm not a dietitian. I'm, I'm a former restaurateur. But um, you'd have to manage your, your glucose. But then typically your diabetes uh, could lead to kidney failure. Uh, and you uh, need to manage phosphorus and potassium. But then somewhere in there you had a stroke uh, because of all your other medical ailments and you'd have to manage your vitamin K. So I would challenge almost anybody in the room, no matter how fabulous the chef you are, or whether you have a RDN initials after your name, to design a meal that's gonna manage for glucose, potassium, phosphorus, and vitamin K. I mean, and that's what, that's the service we provide because who on earth could ever do that um, if you didn't have uh, the science behind it? So again, we're really focused on nutrition. It's high quality meals made from scratch. It's uh, local farm ingredients that we're bringing into our kitchen in Jamaica Plain, 15 different medical diets, and our chefs are working directly with dietitians to design particular menus for each patient. So we prescribe you a meal just as your, do just as your doctor prescribes you pharmaceuticals. And we don't think of it in place of Western medicine or in place of pharmaceuticals. We think of it another tool in the toolbox. So our patients are typically living in poverty, uh, below 150% of the federal poverty level, 94%. Uh, but that's not how they qualify. Any of us in the room would qualify for our service if we didn't have supports. What it's based on is illness and isolation. So your doctor refers you to our program, um, tells us basic lab scores, um, and then tells us mobility issues. Are you able to walk to the store? Can you carry a bag of groceries? And can you stand at a stove for 15 minutes? And that's what would qualify you for the program. And then we recertify you every six to 12 months to see if you're still sick enough to do that. We don't want to create a dependent culture where you get the program forever. We want to get you back up as quickly as possible. Um, our patients are dealing with 35 different illnesses. What we're bringing them is a, a single weekly delivery that includes five days worth of lunches, dinners, and snacks. So a soup and a salad for lunch, uh, homemade soup, entrees and desserts for dinner, yogurt, fresh fruit, and cereal for snacks, and a quart of milk. Um, our largest family is a husband who went blind from diabetes. He and his wife, uh, through the homeless program in Massachusetts, were living in a motel room with their seven children. They had uh, a little refrigerator like this. They had a microwave, and that was it. They had no way to store meals or make meals. They had no implements. They had no plates. So in this case, we went to them every day and brought them hot meals instead of our weekly delivery, but we also brought them plates and silverware. Uh, for all nine of them until they were able to get into supported housing. Um, so we're feeding the critically ill patient, one other adult caregiver, and any children in the household. Um, and you could be on the program for a day if you're an end-of-life hospice patient, uh, and maybe we just got there at the very end. Or you could be with us for 10 or 20 years, depending on what your situation was, but the average is nine to 12 months. And if you think of somebody you know who's gone through, say, breast cancer treatments, you can picture where it would take about nine to 12 months to get back up on your feet after that kind of major tra uh, health trauma. Um, <laughs> the towns we serve, we started out originally in Roxbury and Dorchester. Um, kind of at the centerpiece of the HIV epidemic, um, epicenter of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and we've gradually expanded to what you might know as gateway cities, the very poor communities, Lawrence, Lowell, uh, Worcester, Brockton. Um, uh, we've recently added Framingham, Fitchburg, Lemonster. Um, but we're gradually growing to feed the whole state. We're the only program that does this in the state. So we feel the need to, to keep growing. Um, and it involves more and more fundraising um, to be able to do that. But we also have some other new resources I'll tell you about in a second. So here's a story about two clients, just to give you an indication. So Grady is a gentleman who was uh, loved to cook for himself, uh, lived, I think, in Roxbury. Um, and he became a diabetes, as a, a diabetic, as a lot of people do, uh, particularly in those communities. Um, and uh, his diabetes caused him to have a stroke. And he, could, because of his stroke, he didn't have the mobility to shop and cook for himself. He needed some to do it for him. Um, but because of the stroke, he's on uh, 
uh, a blood thinner called Coumadin that requires him to manage his vitamin K. I didn't even know there was a vitamin K uh, initially. Um, so uh, he's a gentleman who um, needs a diabetic meal, but he also needs a low vitamin K diet. Um, and that's what we're able to provide for him um, because he doesn't have the mobility to do it for himself, even though he'd like to. And then Cherise, this is actually Cherise uh, up here in this photo, um, was a woman going through breast cancer treatments. And she had a particularly bad reaction to the chemotherapy. She could not get off the couch. But Cherise had three beautiful little girls and no other family in the area to care for them. So how the heck was she going to be able to feed those kids? That was more stressful to her than the incredible nausea uh, from the chemo was, oh my God, what am I going to do for my girls? Uh, and of course, if she can't feed her children, the state has to take her children away. So even though her cancer went into remission and she get, went back to being a, a well-functioning, productive mother, how destabilizing for those children's development if they've been pulled out at the scariest time. So for community servings to come in and feed both her and her girls um, was incredibly important. Her girls used to say they felt like they were eating in a restaurant every day when the meals came, which was really sweet. Um, so uh, the term food as medicine has sort of become fashionable and it means a lot of different things. Some people it means uh, whole foods, some it means um, you know, general healthy eating or uh, food in the context of healthcare. We use it in the terms of what we call medically tailored meals. But what we developed here is to sort of give you a context is a pyramid in that if we want to prevent people from being sick, we all know we want to encourage them to eat healthier, right? That goes on here at the farm all the time, I'm sure. So getting people to eat healthier uh, would be sort of the base of the pyramid. A lot of people need that. The, the the wide base of the pyramid, and it's a prevention intervention, right? If, they, if we all ate healthier, we wouldn't be as sick. Um, beyond that, we might be talking about veggie prescription programs where we would say, you know, encourage you to go to your farmer's market, your doctor's giving you coupons to go to the farmer's market. Um, that's, again, a prevention model. Beyond that, you might have a food bank that is saying uh, that they not only make boxes of food at their food pantries all across the state, but they also offer a separate diabetic box, you know, so it's tail a medically tailored food box. But that person still is able to walk to the pantry, get the food, bring it home, and cook it. And then at the very peak would be a program like Community Servings, where it's, it's the most expensive program because we're, we're buying the food, we're making the food, and we're delivering the food. But it's also a much smaller portion of the population that needs it. We're not saying bring our medically tailored meals down at this level. We're saying when we talk to healthcare leaders, we say, maybe you should pay us to do this. This isn't just anti-hunger work. This is really health care. And really what we're doing, you know, it's the old adage, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. We're playing a key role in health care, and health care ought to pay us to do that. Um, because we all struggle to address hunger in this country when you think about what uh, philanthropy can do, charity, God's work, um, but also what we can do through government entitlement programs. What if we could convince capitalism that it's in their best interests to feed low-income people. That would sort of change the whole conversation around hunger in America and how many years, uh, you know, decades we've been struggling with this. Um, so that's really what Community Serving set out to do about five years ago, was we've been living in this sort of anti-hunger world uh, and HIV, and I said, I'm, I said, I'm tired of doing God's work. What we're doing is a, is a smart intervention for people who need food, and we know we're saving money for somebody somewhere. Let's see if we can prove it and then get them to pay us to do it. Um, so that, that's kind of the story I want to tell you here. Um, we set out to try and prove um, that food as an intervention in healthcare saves money. So the first thing we did when we wanted to get health insurers, whether it's Blue Cross or Medicare or Medicaid, uh, to pay us to feed people was we brought them all in the room together and we said, so we know this is a bit of a stretch of an idea that you're gonna feed people through their health insurance. So what would you need to, but we also, you know, you're good people, you understand why we need to do this. 
what would you need to justify it? Or what would your actuary need or your finance person need? And they said, well, you'd have to prove an ROI or return on investment. So we said, okay, that's what we're gonna do. So we've done three research studies at Community Servings. Um, you might have seen this one that came out in April, got a lot of play around the country, um, that was looking at patients that we'd fed versus patients we didn't feed. Um, and looking backwards, uh, we'd already fed them, so we weren't paying for the cost of the food in the study, but we were looking at their insurance billings compared to people we didn't feed. Uh, and what we saw was people that we had fed, comparable people, their insurance costs were 16% lower. And these are very expensive patients. 16% is a big number. Uh, and I always say, if we prevent one night in the hospital, we save enough money to feed you for a minimum of six months. Uh, that's how much it costs to be in the hospital. So a 16% savings when we are all, again, beating our heads against the wall about the cost of our health insurance and what's happening in America with the cost of health care and not great outcomes for the cost we're paying compared to other countries. Food sounds pretty good at 16% savings. There are a lot of people uh, interested in what we're doing because of that. Specifically, it was less ambulance usage, less ER visits, uh, and less hospitalizations. Um, we're now doing a larger study through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that does uh, looking at the same things, but a larger uh, number of claims data um, to see if we, it bears out, and um, that Manuscript is just about to be submitted for publication, but I can tell you with the barn door closed, it reinforces the exact same number, 16% savings. Um, again, these are people who are going to do better because of their food, in other words, directly related to what their illnesses are. But 16% is a big number and really exciting. So now, Health insurers all over around the country are starting to think of what we call social determinants of health, which are the things that impact our health that aren't healthcare. Um, so your housing, your education level, your ability to walk to a store, um, but food is the one that's easiest to measure and uh, we have the data that's proving it. So food is the first thing in the context of healthcare that people are interested in potentially paying for, which was really exciting in the context of hunger. So for community servings, I told you about our medically meals program, and that's kind of what we were founded to do. But we have a pretty big kitchen in Jamaica Plain. Um, it's 13,000 square feet, and we're feeding about 2,000 people a year, about 1,200 people a day. Um, and in order to do it, um, we bring in a lot of volunteers. So we have a lot of engagement in the community. Maybe you've heard of us before tonight. But somewhere in there, we thought, I wonder if we could leverage that same kitchen in other directions at the same time. So our mission, we were put on this earth to feed sick people. But while we're feeding sick people, could we do other things at the same time? Um, so we created this, what we call a program DAISY. Uh, in the nonprofit world, there's something called mission creep, where if you, you start chasing the money, you're a, you're a a food program, but you open a daycare center because somebody gave you money to do it. But that's not really your mission and suddenly you're scattered. So what we created here was the idea that we could do other things in the context of food justice, but only if they supported the meals program. So that's the reason why we're on the earth. So the most uh, exciting example is uh, we have a lot of employees who have come from challenged backgrounds who work in our kitchen. So they came out of prison, they were volunteering with us, we ended up hiring them because they were good workers, they came out of a, a halfway house from addiction and they were working hard to get clean and we were gonna support them in that process. Uh, and we've had tremendous success with that. So about 10, 12 years ago we said, I wonder if we could do the same thing on a bigger scale. So what we decided to do was create a food service training program where we teach people coming out of prison or halfway houses or mental health programs how to work in the food business. It's a, it's a great sort of feeder, no pun intended, feeder uh, line for low income people in the food business. It's a great growth industry because uh, there's a, an endless need for food workers in Massachusetts and in the country. So we said, well, we could teach people how to do that because that's what we've been doing for all of our careers is making beautiful food. But while they're learning, they're gonna help us make meals. 
So they're learning how to cook, but they're helping us ladle soup or package meals at the beginning of their training program. By the end of the training program, they, they might be making the soups or the mashed potatoes or the uh, vegetables uh, to go with the meal. So they help us as much as we help them. So it's a really beautiful win-win in that if you've come out of prison or you've struggled with addiction and maybe you have experience with this in your own families or your own communities, um, the, your, your greatest deficit is a lack of self-esteem. Nobody wants you, you're screwed up, you made bad choices. We you know, we, we know that addiction is an, is an illness, but um, they believe that they screwed up in somehow, some way. So to say that they have value to give back to their community, just like we all do, you know, if you come in our kitchen and, or you work here at the farm, um, or you work in a soup kitchen, you know that you have the ability to give back. But to say to a person who has no self-esteem that they can give back in that way, um, and we're gonna give them job skills at the same time, it's a really cool program. So we run a job training program, as I'll show you in a minute, volunteer program, local farm program, uh, research, food health policy, et cetera. Um, the local foods initiative started with we wanted more beautiful food in our kitchen and in the uh, When we first started this we weren't seeing that kind of food through the food bank um, So we decided to go to local farms uh, and ask them did they have any surplus produce? Uh, as you might know if you're involved here in the farm farms in America grow 50% more than they can sell because they don't know What mother nature which tomato mother nature is going to make perfect? but that's the one you want when you go to the market. Um, the ones that aren't perfect or pockmarked or um, you know, stained uh, are often just thrown away or put in the compost heap or something like that. So we said, if we showed up in your farmyard with an empty truck, would you load us up? What we found is that we can get 50,000 pounds of donated produce. It's not all pretty. Sometimes it's a case where part of it's rotting and part of it's not. But we have so many volunteers in our kitchen, 50 to 75 volunteers a day, that we can pick through all of that. It wouldn't be cost effective for a for-profit necessarily to pick through and find the good parts. They would just as soon throw away the case. But we can harvest all of that and glean it. Um, and we uh, have folks gleaning, the Boston Gleaners is gleaning from us from the farms. Um, uh, but we also get a lot of first quality because there's just surplus. Um, if it's a nonprofit farm that has more than they can sell, we might be getting that as well. So it's an incredible boon to us. Uh, we also, in our kitchen uh, in Jamaica Plain, we run a CSA, like you do here at the farm probably, um, for a farm where if you're in JP, you could come and pick up your share. <laughs> Um, as, you, as you probably do here in Winchester. Um, but if you forget to pick it up or you're on vacation, your share automatically gets donated to our kitchen. So we get to use that. And we do the same thing with what's called community supported fisheries, where you can get day boat fish from Gloucester. But if you don't pick up your fish, we get to use it. Um, and even in small quantities, it can be flavoring stocks or things like that. Um, and then we grow herbs on our property because we, um, we don't use salt uh, to fl flavor our meals. So we're using fresh herbs and lemon and ginger and things like that. So growing herbs on our property uh, allows us to do more of that. Um, so we really love our local foods program and working with um, farms like we are here today. Um, our job training program is called the Teaching Kitchen. We've graduated 300 people. Um, we have about an 85% success rate with people graduating from the program and getting jobs. Uh, and these are usually people in their 40s and 50s who have never held down a job their whole lives. Um, and uh, we like to work with that age group because we, I always said that they've really hit bottom and they realize that whatever m mistakes they were made or bad behaviors they had, um, they're ready to make a significant change and they can commit to it. So um, we have great experience in our kitchen with them and we're placing them. Sometimes they go into restaurants, but oftentimes a restaurant isn't a great environment. It's very stressful and there's a lot of booze, obviously. Um, so grocery stores is a great place to, uh, to place people. There's upward mobility. They're making beautiful food for their hot bar, whether it's you know Whole Foods or Roach Brothers or Wegmans. 
Uh, we're teaching about 90 nutrition classes a year specific to diseases. So how to manage your diabetes through your diet, how to manage your um, cancer, et cetera. We teach them in our uh, kitchen. We also teach them around the community. And then we have a farm to fork program similar to I think what maybe you do here. Uh, in our case, we're bringing low income people into our kitchen. We're teaching them to a CSA box um, so that they're gonna go home with the vegetables that we just taught them how to make. And they can, it's an incentive to get them to come every week to another class. Um, and then it, we're hosting about 7,700 volunteers a year. Uh, it's a huge volunteer program, and if you've never been, it's incredibly fun because you, it's social, f cooking is something you can do and be chatting with your girlfriend at the same time. You can meet with a bunch of friends and then go out for a drink afterwards, um, but you walk away knowing exactly how many people you fed, how many pounds of carrots you peeled, uh, and it's just incredibly empowering to realize, wow, I fed 1,200 people this afternoon. It's, it's very cool, so come and see us. Uh, and we're on the subway line. Um, what we're trying to do is looking to the future, so we're almost 30 years old. Um, with the potential for health insurance contracts, we now have five health insurance contracts that are paying us to feed people, um, which is tremendously exciting. Uh, but in Massachusetts, there's something called accountable care organizations. 17 of them have just kicked off uh, for Medicaid patients, what's called MassHealth. Um, they're all gonna be required to do things like medically tailored meals. So, uh, so we have the potential to feed a lot more people. So we wanna build a kitchen that can do a million and a half meals a year. Um, <laughs> we want to double the number of volunteers. So we're hosting 75 a day. We'd like to be hosting more like 150. We'd like to double the size of our job training program. Uh, and then because of our research and our policy work, and we do it down in Congress, we do it at the State House, um, we want to create what we're calling an accelerator or what I call a, a medically tailored meal university uh, that it teaches people in other parts of the country to do what we're doing here. We think it's pretty cool. We probably have the ability to feed all the critically ill people in Massachusetts, but we can't feed Vermont, and we certainly can't feed Iowa uh, or uh, Texas. Uh, so we'd like to teach what we do around the country to allow more people to do this and then access health insurance uh, monies to be able to do it. So with that, we're building a new building. So um, yeah, has anybody been to our building in Jamaica Plain? Couple people, that's nice. Um, so we moved into our building 10 years ago and we've already outgrown it. But it's next to the subway station, it's right in the middle of JP, it's a great location for us. So we're now building this new three-story building in front of it that's gonna allow us to um, turn our, our current building into all kitchen. So we'll be able to do, as I said, a million and a half meals a year. Um, we're gonna have right here in the front a new teaching kitchen where we can do our job training program, nutrition ed program. We'll be able to film nutrition classes and put them online so you, anywhere in the, in the world you could go online and take a diabetes class from us. Uh, we'll have a research center. Uh, we'll have a community engagement center. Uh, so we think of it as a food campus where we can expand everything that we're doing. Um, it's about a $21 million project, and uh, like Right Lock, we're still fundraising for it. Uh, it's, it's a challenge, but uh, we think it's pretty exciting, and it's, we think it's kind of a national model, and proud to be um, in the center of Boston doing this kind of work. So a couple of years ago, we wrote this, what we call our, our kind of our manifesto, um, and I think it's just a nice way to wrap it up. Um, we believe in the astonishing power of food. Food is sustenance. Everything we've ever achieved was made possible by food. Food is nourishment. It fills our stomachs, fuels our bodies, and wraps us in its warm embrace. I think we feel that on the, on the farm, even on a cold night in October. Food is community for few things in life compared to the simple pleasure of breaking bad bread with family or friends. Food is powerful medicine, and it has the ability to heal not just the sick, but the loved ones that care for them. Food is an agent of change. It has the power to engage world leaders, big business, and change the way America feeds the sick. Let us then celebrate the many powers of food. And that's my story. Just, just one shameful plug, because we're always, uh, all anyone, 
in social justice work is always trying to find the resource to do it. So um, I used to run a restaurant in Harvard Square called Upstairs at the Pudding. Some of you might know. I, I wasn't the owner, but I was the general manager there for 10 years. And while I was there, I started working for community servings. And I thought, I wonder if I could get friends in the restaurant business to bake pies for Thanksgiving. And we could sell them like Girl Scout cookies. Um, and so it was just an idea that kitchens were, restaurants were slow the week of Thanksgiving because people were eating at home. And the first year, we unexpectedly sold a 1,000 pies. We thought we had died and gone to heaven. Um, we've now been doing, this is our 26th year. This year we will sell over 25,000 pies baked by 150 different kitchens all across the state. So restaurants, hotels, caterers, churches, all coming together to bake pies. Uh, if you buy a pie from community servings, it's based on the idea that we all need a pie on our table because that's the traditional Thanksgiving dessert. Um, but we also need to express our thanks for the harvest in one way or another, if you think of the uh, tradition of Thanksgiving. Um, the price of a pie is the equivalent of feeding one of our patients for a week. Uh, so you get a beautiful pie from a local restaurant um, and you're generating enough revenue for the raw food cost to feed somebody for a week. So it's a really beautiful equation. Um, it's all based off of going on our website, either community servings, uh, website servings.org or our pie site called pieinthesky.org. You order a pie for yourself or it can be what we call a virtual pie, which is essentially giving a, a donation that allows us to bring pies to our clients. Um, but if you're going to buy the pie, you pick your flavor and you pick one of a hundred locations across the state to pick it up. So it's near your house, it's here in Win Winchester, it's in Arlington or Belmont maybe. Um, or it's near your work, um, and you're going to pick it up the day before Thanksgiving. So it's a really nice uh, bake sale on steroids. <laughs> and there are postcards in the back, but we'd really love to have your uh, support at this time of year. It's a great way to remember uh, those who are less fortunate, but also to celebrate the important things of food in our culture and food justice. So thanks. Uh, questions? You started out. Yep, I, I was super. So one of the things I learned in, in healthcare, they call that being upstream. Downstream is you're already sick. Upstream is kind of a prevention model. Um, our meals, because we're feeding the whole family, are sort of hitting various points because those kids or those family members are at risk of getting sick if they're not eating the right thing or they're not eating at all because mom or dad is, you know, end of life. So we're dealing with the treatment side and the upstream side. Um, usually, though, it's funded through grants um, and fairly small grants. Um, so, you know, if there's no hospitals in the room, um, you know, they give $20,000 to fund a veggie prescription program or a grant or something like that. Um, it's a little harder to prove an ROI from their business perspective. Um, and then the other funny thing that I learned about healthcare is that. Um, you're not going to be their patient. If, you, if they're preventing you, if they get you to stop smoking or something like that, or they're going to prevent you from having lung cancer 20 years from now, that doesn't really help them because you're probably not going to be their customer 20 years from now. It, it helps society and it helps you, but it doesn't necessarily help their bottom line. So generally, when you talk to healthcare, they're interested in what their savings are going to be within the next two years. So it's a little harder to justify going upstream in that way, if that makes sense. Other questions? Uh, I think they will. We work closely with the Mass Medical Society, which is the local society for physicians in Massachusetts, and they're big supporters. I think sometimes there's a confusion that we're saying don't do pharmaceuticals, um, which you know we, you can have your own opinion as to whether you do or don't believe in you know big pharma, but. Ultimately, most drugs need food to be absorbed into your bloodstream. So if you're taking them on a, I, we used to do, I used to do HIV work in Africa, and people would say, uh, we actually get the meds through the Gates Foundation or the Clinton Foundation, but we take them on an empty stomach. Um, and what happens when you take a toxic pill? You spit it up. So it doesn't work without food. So um, 
but the flip side of that is that nutrition is also, I always say it's the, the poor stepchild of Western medicine. Doctors are generally not ever trained in nutrition. It's, uh, I had uh, the, the Surgeon General told a story last year I heard, uh, he said it, he had one elective course and it was on a Saturday morning when he was in med school. And that was the only training that his, as a physician in med school, they got on nutrition. So there isn't really an understanding and dietitians are poorly staffed in hospitals. There isn't enough of them. And so it's a very short intervention, as I said before. So um, I think it's a gradual evolution, but I think, you know, frankly, hitting them on a business case is the first step towards getting them to pay attention. So, so I didn't mention that it's kind of the, the sadder part of the story. We carry a waiting list of people um, and it can be as high as 150 people. Uh, and you can be on, on a waiting list for our program for three to six months. Uh, and of course, if you're sick enough to need a public, you know, this kind of public support um, at a time when you're sick, uh, you don't need it three or six months, you need it yesterday. Um, so it, the reason why we started this health insurance uh, outreach was specifically because we knew there were more people to be fed um, and we can have a waiting list even without doing outreach or without doing marketing. Um, so we feel the kind of moral imperative to feed those people. So the, the research and the effort we're putting into policy and congressional visits is, is all about trying to feed those people. So. So with your vision to you know, increase your capacity, are you looking to try to better serve your current footprint and you know, meet some of this wait list? Or is it really to continue to spread throughout all of Massachusetts? And if you do that, <coughs> is your current you know, capacity or, or the planned capacity going to be able to serve the whole state? Or how do you plan to fulfill it's, um, it's all of that demand. With your help. <laughs> Multiple, I'm just curious, do you envision yourself as you know, maintaining the central commissary or is it going to be kind of a main one with satellites? The, all, all good questions. What we're trying to do is feed all of Massachusetts uh, is the kind of ambitious goal. Uh, we also have a, one city in Rhode Island that we're feeding now. Um, but um, we certainly need to feed more people. So when I say we feed 21 communities, you probably the first thing you looked at, Winchester wasn't on there um, because we sort of pick areas with high poverty incidents and also cancer incidents. But we need to fill in the rest of the map here in eastern Massachusetts, but we also need to think about places like Holyoke and Springfield and Fall River and New Bedford that would have tremendous need as well. So we're trying to do both. And we think the revenue is going to be there through these insurance contracts to do that. Uh, and hopefully more philanthropy as people see the good work that we're doing. Um, in terms of commissary, uh, so our new building is costing $21 million. Um, kitchens are very expensive. Um, so you're not going to build m many kitchens. Um, the idea, what we're and there, there are efficiencies of scale. So to do it in one kitchen versus, you know, even if we had other kitchens, to make the same soup all across the state doesn't necessarily make sense. So the intention is to make them and to make a plane, and we may ultimately have a refrigeration um, satellite site, say in Worcester or Springfield, where we would bring meals out in bulk and then have a network of our drivers to mirror the, net, the drivers that we have in Jamaica Plain, and we'd have a second set in Western Mass. Nobody keeps track of that. So the first thing we did was we went to the state and said, so how many homebound critically ill patients are there? Because people are asking us what you just asked, Sorgi. And they said, well, we don't actually track that. So it's pretty hard to figure out. Um, we call them, I always, I used to call them super utilizers. It's that 5% of the population that takes 50% of healthcare dollars. Now they use the term high cost, high need patients. And you can sort of go from hospital to hospital. I was meeting with Partners Health today and they said, oh, well we have, I forget, I think it was 1% of their population within their Medicaid program were high cost, high need. Um, but that could be, you know, like a 
thousand people, and then you think that's just one hospital system, and so uh, not all of those people would benefit from a medical diet, um, but for those who would, so it's a little hard to estimate. Our, um, so you're doing food and nutrition classes and education. Um, I assume that it mo mostly focuses on the folks who you're serving, but are you also educating um, like people in hospitals or like the kind of that, the, the other educators who could then bring that nutrition in? So we've done some train the, tr that's, so you, you, you probably already know this, but that's called train the trainer. Mm -hmm. We've done some train the trainer where we'll give our kind of nutrition 101 curriculum to anybody in the state. Mm -hmm that wants to use it uh, and show them how to do it. Um, and then, but we're also teaching not just our patients who oftentimes aren't well enough to come to a class, but also going out and teaching a class, you know, like we were talking earlier about doing, you know, if you did something at the farm for cancer, it might be our dietitian coming in and teaching a class like that or up in Lowell or something like that. They're not very well funded, so it's hard to do a lot of it. You know, in general, it's probably people, well, I wouldn't even say that. I was going to, you know, if I looked at the profile of the folks in a broad generalization, it's generally low-income people who are struggling with health issues, but, you know, they're relevant to anybody. But say we could refer patients. You could refer patients. You could come yourself. The food is delicious. We give tastings while we're teaching, so it's the best way to get people to come to class. Uh, we need a really big check. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's a partnership. Community Serving started it, but we work with a group at Harvard Law School called the Center for Health Law uh, and Food Law, um, and they help us with the policy side of it. We work with a group called Nonprofit Finance Fund, which uh, nationally works on finance uh, and scaling uh, work with us. And then we work with our sister program in New York called God's Love We Deliver, um, where God's Love and Community Servings bring sort of the operational experience, and the other two are bringing other more specialized, and together we're writing a curriculum. The planning for this was funded by AARP Foundation, and we're asking them would they consider funding the, you know, a, a three-year rollout of it, which would be really exciting if it, we'll know by Christmas time whether it's, the holiday season, whether it's coming through. Anybody else? Do you know if the people who you know, used you know, community servants when they were could feel and then you know, hopefully they recover, um, do you have any knowledge or research whether those people change their behaviors and change the way that they you know, prepare food on their own once they've healed? They usually do. That's why we're offering them nutrition ed and nutrition counseling, because we don't want them to go, if they were eating McDonald's or chips and soda before they came to us, we don't want them to go back to that. So um, it's hard to, do. there isn't outcomes you can measure, because they tend to sort of disappear once you've cared for them. Um, but in general, they've been on the program long enough that we've modeled, first of all, we've gotten them to eat the food. We've discovered that healthy, we've, hopefully they've discovered that healthy food tastes good because they think that it needs high salt and um, you know, they're used to eating processed foods. So weaning them off of that. But then we've also modeled portion control because they've seen what is an appropriate portion of starch versus protein versus vegetable and stuff like that. So it's, to me it's the best way of teaching is that if they've been eating food like that, then they've over a course of a year, then it that starts to make sense for them to do it on their own. And we have a, if you if you sign on to our website or our email list, we send out regular recipes um, to everybody on our list. So we, any of us could get you know an interesting. Somebody came to me yesterday and say, I have too many eggplants in my garden, and you just published a great recipe for eggplants. Um, so it's a great resource, um, and our dietitians are. Um, curating that so it's um, it's all healthy recipes that people can access. Yeah. Really relevant question. So we tend to like what we like, what we grew up with, and you know the concept of comfort food. Um, we want to do that, but we also want to bring it healthier. So there are programs, like you might know somebody on a Meals on Wheels program, where they're, if they're a Russian immigrant, they only have Russian diets, or they grew up 
uh, Ethiopian or Haitian and they only want Haitian food. We don't do what are called ethnic, di ethnic diets because we do medical diets and we couldn't overlay them. So instead what we do is we try to represent the communities that we serve primarily, which the largest population for us is African American, Latino, and Haitian. So we want to bring dishes from those cultures, ideally. So what we've done to accomplish that is that the demographics of our chefs are the same as the demographics of our clients. So our sh we go to our chefs and say, bring in recipes from home. What did your grandmother make? What was her flan recipe or uh, you know, Puerto Rican dishes, beans and rice, collards? Um, and then we figure out with our dietitians how to make those healthier. So you're not going to see purely Latino you can't be on a Latino track, but in the course of our deliveries, you're going to regularly see, you know, beans and rice or collards or things like that. Yep. Anybody else? I got one more. Um, so, what are some of the challenges that you found again working uh, again, like our farm, actually? In uh, differently, we don't have that 50% um, kind of, we actually use a, we're very efficient at using our, our food, what little comes out of, well, it's a lot uh, coming out of two acres, but um, farming and local farming, so, you know, it's so, it can be hit or miss, and again, like, so affected by the weather and different factors. Uh, what are some of the biggest challenges you've had working with the <laughs> farmers and everything. <laughs> so my favorite is, so if you picture our, picture our chefs are doing you know, 15 different medical diets and overlaid on top of each other, so you're doing diabetic, renal, vitamin K in the same meal. But we never know what's coming from the farms. Mm -hmm. uh, we all, I didn't mention before, we also glean from farmers markets. Mm -hmm. So what's been sitting in the sun in August for too long, the farmer's not gonna take it back because it will have rotted by the next day and they don't have refrigeration, they'll tend to throw that away. But we work with another local program called Love and Spoonfuls where they're at the market gleaning uh, from the farmer's st stalls and they'll bring it to us. So when our chefs come in in the morning, the coolers, the walk-in refrigerators are all full of produce, but we had no idea what was coming. And it's a thousand pounds of zucchini. And God forbid any of those zucchinis don't get used because it's too precious to us. So, you know, there's this mad scramble of like, quick, bring me every recipe you have for zucchini because we got to figure out a way to incorporate it into every single meal <laughs> um, because we want to see that used. So, it's a lot of creativity. We call it the dance. Yeah. Yes. It's like, how do you do all these complex medical diets? Use a volunteer workforce that you don't know if they're coming or not. Mm -hmm. um, and food that you don't know what's what's coming either. So it's it's kind of the really fun, interesting part of what we do. Yeah. So you had a question. Um, so you talked about how many volunteers you have. What's your pay staff for? So we have about 60 employees. Um, we're also a union business. Um, so we're really focused on bringing our own employees out of poverty. Um, so they start at the Boston Living Wage. Um, and then the volunteers are the equivalent of another uh, if you added up all the hours of volunteer time, it's the equivalent of 30 full-time employees. Yeah. So another 50% on top of our paid workforce is the generosity of the community coming in to help us make meals. Anybody else? Well, you're probably all cold and you want to go home. So. Uh, <laughs> It's just an incredible honor to be here, and I hope this has been uh, relevant for you. Um, check us out. Uh, check out the farm. Um, there are a lot of people doing amazing food justice work in communities all across the state, whether it's farming or job training or medically tailored meals, um, and they all need your support. Um, so uh, I think the fall harvest time is a perfect time for us all to recommit to feeding people who are disadvantaged in our communities. So thank you. Thank you.